first of all i want to get away from the dictionary definition of a constitution a constitution must have purpose and the purpose must be to create a nation that conduces to the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people that is what a constitution must be and having set the objective of the constitution you then frame a constitution to achieve that objective because we really do have a race problem those divisions are real we see it in our politics we see it in our trade union we see that they take the divisions with them look at where people live in this us you have enclaves in in the bronx and and in richmond hill and in and and in brooklyn they're taking the division with them women are dying in the streets and we have a government pontificator running around campaigning for women's vote no women should vote in this election coming up unless there is something done to the legislation as magistrate kim is advocating that voices like ours that are not in the political trench fighting it out voices like ours should um become stronger one of the things about the caribbean is that we have never had one discourse Bas will know the days of the new world and the old world and the radical left and 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 so on. What we had was this concourse of ideas, which I think in the early days of independence pushed up, pushed us in in a certain direction. We have got to move back to that point of having these multiple discourses. Good night to our viewers and good night to our Globespan team. To all of our viewers over at uh, in the diaspora in US, Canada, UK, uh, I must say I wish you well. I I know it's um it's getting to that time in the year. Today in Guyana, viewers all today in Guyana we are at a serious juncture of our history. While the political parties are gearing up for the elections campaign and the season of rallies and public meetings, we, the people of this country, are becoming increasingly concerned at the state of affairs of our country. Pre-independence, there was PPP government. Then from 1964 to 1992, there was PNC government. 1992 to 2015, PPP government. 2015 to now, coalition led by the main party being the PNC. During these 50 odd years of independence, we have received every promise under the sun. And we have seen them all broken at some stage. Every time we are set to advance as a nation, we are brought to our knees, sometimes by backward politics and aging politicians. Generations of youths have left these shores and have in no small way contributed greatly to the countries in which they have established their homes. Now, as we are approaching another election, we will hear again of all the promises of empowering youths and placing the youths in the political agenda. As for myself, ever since I was a young man, I heard promise of placing youths on a national agenda, but you, those youths who have gotten ahead only did so because they were the favored ones, handpicked, selected because of their adherence to the glue of party patrimony and not because of their hunger for advancement or academics. In other words, you need to belong to the system before you can move ahead. And in this way, numerous youths who could have contributed significantly to this country's development were pushed aside, and the evidence were clearly manifested in the language and public deportment of those who pushed them away. As we approach this election, therefore, we again want to look at the strategies that some of the political parties may design that would either include or exclude the younger generation. Tonight, of course, we could have brought into this panel a lot of youngsters, a lot of youths who would want to say what they want of the system. And we are planning to have that as a second part or, or as a follow up to tonight, because tonight we have in our discussion, we want to focus on how some of the current and gentlemen, sorry for calling you, James, my brother, James and Robin, sorry for calling you this. But tonight I want to see how we how the current older persons in the political social groups would wish to see youth's position <coughs> in the immediate future of Guyana. Do we believe that the PPP or PNC would be more inclusive of young people's energies, dreams, and qualifications? Or are the young people expected to get a party card before expecting a job in this country? Where are we heading? Where do we want to go? 
Can the younger generation of this country hope that their time has come when they can be involved in nation building? Tonight, as I said, we are going to discuss the strategies for youth involvement in politics and nation building. We have chosen to ask, as I said, those who have been in the system, those who have, and as, as I will introduce them, you will see and know some of these, well, all three of these gentlemen who have been active on the social and political scene. And after this, this panel discussion, we are going to engage youths in another episode like this. Colleagues, viewers, we have Mr. James Bond, a chess player, I mean that literally, once president of the association, member of parliament and of the PNC executive. And I ask my brother James to be on, on this show, particularly because if it's one thing James has been known for ever since I've known of him, is his calling for youth involvement and youth inclusion in nation building, not just in PNCR, but in nation building. We also have tonight Mr. Robin Singh, a social activist who has become vocal on matters of political nature. Uh, he is once he he who was once seen as independent has now probably lost his independence, but he is also head of the baseball league and has been vocal about matters relating to politics and government. For example, he was very vocal about the security cameras installation, Huawei and some of the contracts that the government has entered into. And we also have another colleague of ours, a younger person, Mr. Kian Jabor, a member of a new and united Guyana, who also is here tonight to express his views on how his party and well, his persona to how they expect to embrace or to have youth involvement in nation building. Gentlemen, welcome to the forum. My brother James, welcome. Uh, Robin, welcome. Kian, welcome to the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, James, James, I want to start with you first. You are the more experienced and seasoned man and you are the lawyer in a lot here. Now, you have come out of the youth arm of the PNC. Many people, and I tell you this, James, Many, many people feel that you have not been allowed to contribute in the way that you could. And you have now, becoming, have, have now become an older person within the same party. Tell us about this dichotomy. Why would young people stick with a party system that has penalized you for 30 years while people double your age are occupying jobs that they are clearly unfit for? Sorry to put you on a spot, but let's roll. Let's get the ball rolling. Well, and you said I'm a chess player. So if I did not expect that, um, I, I, I would be naive. Um, but I want to thank you again for the opportunity. And I must say that um, you should have given a disclaimer for some of the statements. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your views, but some of the views we may differ with. Sure. For example, the first thing is um, I did not come through the party ranks. I, I was... Just like uh, Kian or Robin, I was just observing national politics and Winston Murray because of uh, my, how vocal I was. And without social media, he asked me to join him when he ran for leadership of the PNCR. And um, his focus was on youth. And um, if you know the PNC, when I got in there, I did not join the youth term, but I was very, very, as you said, vocal with representatives for young people because I saw not just the party level, uh, not just at the PP level or the AFC level or WPA level. The nation, that respect that the nation should give to youth, um, that respect was dwindling. I know in times past, young people were, were, were cherished and youth and vigor were, cher were, were cherished. Um, that seems not the case. You can remember stories of Forbes Bonner making um, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Thomas a minister in his 20s. Um, you know, a lot of these guys that Burnham, uh, President Burnham pushed, they were extremely, extremely young. Um, but as you see, as you said rightfully, uh, it seems as though persons are moving away from youth. And um, the, 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 what we call the older generation still seems to have a, a, a grasp or a clasp on the, the instrumentalities of power, the cards of power. However, I believe that is as a result of there being a dearth of, of um, qualified youth, so to speak. Um, I want to see young people advance. I want to see young people succeed. But I want to see young people more than ever before 
give them the tools to succeed. Uh, one thing I know growing up, I'm 40 now, so I no longer consider myself a young person. One thing I know for sure is that we were given the tools, for example, of education when I was young. Scholarships were provided. I, I got a Hinterland scholarship. I got a Government of Guyana scholarship. And um, because I grew up, I, I, I come from a very poor background. So education was there. There was training. I know you know the days of national service and GTI and GTIC and these things were there. I see now government pivoting in terms of increased emphasis on education, increased emphasis on training, increased emphasis on empowering young persons in terms of making them entrepreneurs, uh, that kind of thing. I could give, I could give practical examples. Um, there's a leadership uh, co core that goes on to the uh, military presidency. About 1,700 young people are trained. Uh, were trained since um, the coalition government came into power. For the first time, we had youth representatives of the United Nations. We have the, the, the HEYS for the Hinterland uh, students uh, in terms of grants and empowerment with them. For the first time, we have a, a youth initiative fund, a youth of uh, $50 million annually. We also have about $4 billion given out to small business uh, folks and young people. Uh, if I look at the public sector and the, the public service in terms of training young people and scholarships, um, there's a the Bertram Collins College training young people. There's we've given out more scholarships now than before. So now I see a pivoting of equipping young people. Um, all the agencies, youth, culture, sport, uh, with, they now have policies, draft policies. Though policy not in place, they mm -hmm. have draft policies for youth, sport, and culture. Um, the but, departments but, are headed by young people. But James, uh, let me energy is headed by young persons. Let me interrupt you for one, one, one. Uh, bring you back to one point. Um, so, so it's it's wonderful, as you said. You have seen a pivot that that the the in from from the perspective of your from your perspective, there is a pivot where uh, more more opportunities are made to the youngsters. Two things there. Are you satisfied enough is being done? But the more important part of my question was whether there is enough being done to get youth involvement in nation building. So well, I was coming to that. Okay. I was coming to that. I, I had I had to lay the foundation. I have to show that um, you cannot. Uh, let me answer directly then, because I think I would have stressed enough on mm. the foundation. Are you a young? I cannot. I could. I cannot contribute to the country except I'm equipped. I'm I'm able to contribute uh, whether it's philanthropy, whether it's uh, mentorship, etc. Because I would have been equipped um, throughout my life to better serve. Um, serve this country. And then the point of whether enough is done, no. Enough is not being done. I, I always said it's just, we could always do more for young people. And um, I said it in 2011, I said it in 2015 that um, I was not, um, I wanted to see more youngsters coming through the ranks. And Correct. In, in, that. in 2016, you said when you were running for VC of the PNC, you said, uh, quote unquote, um, you call for a fresh tier of leaders to be found. Yeah, and, and, and that was that was admirable. That was admirable of you. Let, let, let's let's jump over to, to Robin a little bit. And I must tell you something, James. Before I I, I move off, um, uh, we do share a, a mentor. Um, uh, it's not known uh, uh, out there, but uh, Winston Moray and, and and I had a lot a lot of uh, discussions, and he was that was a great man. That yes, he was indeed a wonderful strategist, and uh, also he had some long-term visions that I don't think uh, have been appreciated at all. Robin, let's come to you, my brother. You have been on the sidelines for a long time. You were an activist on a non-party platform, and you were believed to have been independent until, of course, recently you were seen as a PPP insider. If that is so, why this change? Is it because you can't cut it on the outside? And what encouragement is there for others? And especially, uh, you're one of the now older persons. Um, why or, or what strategies, what gravitated you towards the PPP instead of, of keeping that independent platform you were on? Well, well, it comes from my individual journey where I was in a career of sports where I work with youth. That's empowerment. That's how I know James. James is a big supporter of baseball when it started. We're good friends. I love the work he's done with chess. Because for me, when you do things like chess, 
you're teaching people to think. You're, think, you're teaching them what impulse reactions will react. You will have to pay consequences for actions, and that's what chess is about. It's a great tool. Same with sport. So I got involved with politics, um, I think the PPP a bit, because of the cricket board issue. But along the way, I read a lot. I did my own research. I never accepted what was told to me. And, and James knows how I think. I'm a man, if you tell me yes or, or, or X, Y, I will go and look for the World Bank report. And say, so, well, the World Bank report don't say X or Y. And along the way, parts diverge. I found myself not agreeing with a lot of what was said about the PPP and corruption because I wasn't seeing the evidence. I, I wasn't seeing the evidence that everyone was talking about because I was looking for it. I wasn't accepting what was being sold to me that $500 billion was being stolen and, and the annual budget was $120 billion. Those kinds of, you know, propaganda. So I, I started writing. I started, actually, I started mentoring younger people to think about politics and let us read and let us, let us discuss what is actually being said to us. And even though I am older, my political journey would have only started maybe four and a half, five years ago. Before then, I was in, working in sport. Happily, I might have had. Um, but when you get to the point and you look at sport, the only way you're going to really help kids the only way you're going to really make an impact is to get the air to be listened to higher up. So that when you bring your sport plan, it's not dismissed, but you're known, you're known for your views, you're known for your outspokenness, and people will listen. Um, the PPP has listened to me, and that is one of the reasons um, I am where I am, because we both have a, a fact-based approach to things. I... Um, as I said, I'm a great admirer of James, and every now and then he and I will play a little propaganda war. But I, that, that's fun. But we don't lie. If James and I used to lie, we wouldn't have survived very long. We stick to facts. We might twist them, or we might not mention the facts that are not favorable to our side. But, but that's what we do. What, we, what I say to anybody, read anything I write. And if I say that when the PPP inherited the government debt to... Um, GDP ratio was 153%. You got Google in front of you. You Google it and you find it's 159%. You might say, all right, he fudged a little bit. He make a mistake. But if you find it 39%, you can say there's an outright liar. You wouldn't believe anything I have to say. So that's why I want young people to know. First of all, to be empowered, empower yourself. Check your facts. Don't listen to any leader, anybody. Keep checking. The, Google, the World Bank reports are there. The IMF reports are there. The right. Bank of Ghana reports are there. All right. So that's where I ended up with the PPP because I was checking a lot of facts. On, on your point, on your point of, of online facts, you got to be aware too that there's a lot of yeah. fake news out there, right? And that's why I pointed out the World Bank reports, IMF, yeah. Bank of Guyana. Those are always, you know, you'll find all the development projects. Perfect. Not all are perfect, and, and we have to understand things keep evolving and plans keep changing. Young people are not going to be given anything that they don't take for themselves. You got young people, Irfan Ali went into parliament very young, and he took responsibility, he delivered, and that's why he is where he is today as presidential candidate. And you can see a progression of where he started and where he is. Good. And he's still growing as a person, he's still trying. Good. Let's you move know. the conversation along. Kian, let's come to you a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, uh, you, you are with a uh, part, uh, well, a new and united Guyana, Anug. Um, first of all, the question that one might want to ask you is, is why you didn't, if, if you have a desire to enter into politics, why you didn't gravitate towards the PPP or PNC? But that's an uh, uh, um, expected question. But it, the point is, as a young person, what hope, do you see within your party framework? And the frank question I would like you to address, what if your party has one seat? Who do you think will get that seat? Will it be a young person or will it be an older person? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me on here. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be on with these two gentlemen and because likewise, I do share a very similar view that um, when having discussions of any sort um, in the positions that we're in, which is uh, on a spotlight basis, now that we're representing political groups, facts are critical. And, um, you know, what we need to start to look at is, uh, as, as youths, 
is what are the facts of our lives? Um, you ask, uh, you ask who, who, who will take parliament? <laughs> it's a funny question, but nonetheless, that has definitely not been decided within the ranks of our party yet. Like everyone else, we will have a list of 65 people, 30% um, women. Um, as our executive currently stands, you know, it's about 70% youth. Um, you know, lots of people have questioned who to our uh, presidential candidate and his age. Um, you know, I guess much can be said about, you know, one of the other larger parties and their older candidate as well. But unfortunately, that's not the reality of the situation. And I think we can all appreciate that. that um, that's hard. I think Ralph, I mean, we all know Ralph is a very respected uh, person. And, um, you know, we admire his, I think we admire anybody's gumption to go there and create a party in Guyana and wanting to face the electorate. But continue. Yeah, so when it comes to wanting to create a party, you you know, you you lead into why would someone like myself gravitate towards a new party versus any other um, political party uh, or, or any of the other two, ex three existing parties. Um, and in reality, why I was drawn to a new and united Ghana came on the core belief that constitutional reform is what's necessary for Guyana. And um, I like these two gentlemen, I did my own research, studied, read our constitution, got into some detail. You know, as I spent my last, uh, call it seven, eight, nine years here in Guyana as a young businessman, trying to develop and get my uh, feet on the ground, challenges that I encountered are ones that I had to assess on a regular basis and where this, these are stemming from. What are the root of my issues? What what is holding me back from reaching my full potential as a youth, as a young businessman? And um, as I looked around my peers and I, you know, got into more questions and started to do my own research, like I said, we had a lot of core issues that were stemming from our system of governance. And because of that, I had to now determine where I, as an individual, being completely apolitical up to this point, had to decide where I should lend my voice. And as Anug's message took shape and I started to meet with them, much like I'm sure these gentlemen met with their party and you know got into discussions with, with um, those involved, I started to see that a lot of it, a lot of our values and ideologies started to align. And we're in a position right now in Guyana that we have a lot of opportunity for change, um, whether it be our incumbent resources, whether it be um, uh, 2011 elections showing us that um, our electorate is interested in looking at different options when it comes to their political uh, affiliations. Mm -hmm. So how now do we take this opportunity and alter our system of governance through constitutional reform in various um, um, various aspects, and where do we go from here? How do we now get ourselves into Parliament, create a minority government, create the plurality, and from there, give more power back to Guyanese in general, whether it be young or old, and find out how can we get more involved as individuals into the governance of our country? Thank you. James, I, I want to come to you and Robin with a particular question. Um, uh, every time we speak politics in Guyana, there is the notion that the PNC um, is, is uh, ethnically oriented towards one side and uh, the PPP is toward the other side. And uh, the twain shall never meet. Um, the Talking about youth strategies, I think we all recognize that the younger persons with each passing day do, would not have the same sentiments, race-based sentiments, as the older persons. What, what would be the PNC's position in terms of being open? And, and I say so recognizing your uh, chairperson made a statement sometime not in, in the not-too-distant past about about wanting particular kind of persons to to employ um 
so so what would be your and, and Robin also you from from the PPP's perspective, do you see that these two parties are going to become more inclusive of, of every other is not just for political and electioneering purposes, but as a as a strategy for the development of this country? All right, thanks, thanks. Um, and Yog, I must commend you for the, the level of questions you're asking. I love the questions you're asking. Um, I don't like uh, cotton candy questions. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, Robin, Robin and I, 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 he did say that we were very close, but um, he probably didn't tell you that um, his history uh, is one of, of the PNC, that is, is rooted in the PNC. And uh, one day I know we will work together in this same great party. Um, but besides that, our, our PNC has always been a party that was inclusive. If you, if you know the split that occurred in the 50s, is our first year person was, was of East Indian descent. Um, as I said, Robin's father, uh, grandfather, is a very senior member of our party. Um, his his father. is on the wall. Father is father. on the wall in our Hall of Heroes. His father is on the wall of our party. Um, mm -hmm. The very chairman you spoke of, Minister Walter Lawrence, um, is chair of the Georgian district and made the a pandit Ubesh Narayan in his 20s, mayor of Georgetown. Um, our party has never been exclusive to a particular race. Uh, we've always been inclusive of all races. It's always been a, 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 can a canopy whereby all races find a home. Um, our general secretary is of East Indies. And the person who got me to the PNC was Vincent Murray, who's an Indian man. So, the party has never excluded any race. Now, what, is, what has happened is that, um, and we can't fault the PNC for this, not the PPP, is that the majority of afro guyanese felt represented, proper represented within the PNCR. Whereas the majority of East Indians felt better represented uh, by the PPP, People's Progressive Party Civic. You can't fault them for that. If but but, but, but James, James, let me stop you there. But yeah. you have had, forget the past. Yeah. The mo let's come to the more recent past. You have had four years to change that. And I'm telling you, I'm saying right Go now, on. our composition, the composition of our party is a reflection of the entire country. Um, Amerindians, East Indians, we have Portuguese in our party. I don't think we have a Chinese uh, in the senior, in the hierarchy of the party, but we have someone of Chinese descent in the first lady who has some Chinese descent in her. Uh, so we are represented in all races, but I'm saying we cannot fault society for or persons for going on block to either party. Neither party, I could say for, for my party, we have not at any single time well, dissuaded or discouraged other races from being represented by uh, by other parties. Um, even right now as we speak, Ganesh Maipal, who is our, our, our Region 3 rep, is hosting a tongue on meeting in, in, in the U.S. So our party is inclusive, and I want to say I would like, and it's ideal for any party, to see balance. Mm -hmm. I do not think um, anyone could look at the parties and say, you know what, uh, there is absolute balance 50-50, or 60, 40, or, or that nature. But it's how our society is. And um, you made a point when we said that the young people are clamoring for this change. But there are some examples, and I saw an example in UG today of a young brother uh, being extremely racist. And I, I'm on the 40s. I know I'm, I'm no racist. I know Robin, as a matter of fact, is his 40s as well. Absolutely no racist bone in his body. So my generation, I know for sure. We grow in a particular manner in which we frowned upon everything about racism. It's not possible okay. for us to be racist. So I think the younger generation now, I, I, and I think we need to reach out across the aisle more, the PPP and the PNC. Let me make this point. I, I have brothers in the PPP civic, and I'm going to call one of my brothers out, Robert Passat. That's my brother. Hands down, that's my brother. And I told Robert, uh, whilst we were having a drink a few years ago, about six, seven, eight years ago, I says, Robert... At some stage, there has to be a handshake. You and I have to reach across the aisle. Have to. Because I'm not leaving the PNC to go and join the PP Civic. I don't think that that would help. That would help the conversation. I believe we need to sit where we are, reach across the aisle, and show Guyana 
that you know what? This is how it should be because it's not going to happen except like, I think the two major parties right. actually come that way. I, and I think, I think that is will, a point. I will that is, with, yeah, go on, Robin. I will concur with James completely on most things. Um, what, what we find is that, yes, there are people who are comfortable for one reason or the other, historically or whatever. In my case, if I don't like something, I will change party. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, and I'm not in the, in the, on the end of the PPP because of my ethnicity, but because we share a lot of ideals. And that's why there's a civic. Now, the PPP has been making great efforts recently. That's a, I would say maybe the last 20 years, but even more so in opposition. When is, which is when your party grows. When you're in opposition, then is when you find out who your friends are, who, who's willing to join, and that's when you find space. When people are in power, they rarely find space for you, uh, and that's politics. And um, in the PPP, for example, you will find um, a lot. If you look at the representation simply in, 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 in Parliament of the 32 members, 13 are Indian, the rest are mixed races, Portuguese, Amerindian, mixed race, black, whatever. And, and that says something about how the party is going. They're making an effort to change. And if you go into the leader of the opposition's office, you'll see the close people around him are not a set of Indian people or whatever. Sometimes um, I am the only Indian in the room being consulted, so to speak. So wait, so wait, you're uh, so there, there is a drive to include. <laughs> Seriously, there is a drive to include um, everybody, listen to all the points of views, because we... We have cultural differences. We might arrive at the same uh, position, but how we get there, right. you know, or how our brains are wired. As a, as, a, as a sports coach, this has always been important to me. How is your brain wired? How do I explain the same thing I want Bob to do that I want Robin to do? How do I explain it to Bob differently from Robin and get them to do the same thing? But it requires different techniques, reaching out, and people hear code words in things if you say our government and a man is wired to hear that you're racist then he's saying oh my god he's excluding me Correct. not understanding our could mean all guyanese so those are things that you got to be very cognizant when you're building unity and when you're building a nation and and james is right there is a, a need to reach across often and and we do keep lines of community i do um because i have a lot of friends in the pnc and and, and a few other parties even in anuk and I'm always encouraging them to share their views. I always tell people, right, let me, let's see what you're thinking. I don't just want to know what Ralph is thinking. I want to know what other members of Anuk are thinking. Um, it's not to criticize them, but it's to give them, the, you're on a platform. Let me hear what you're thinking. Right. Because good ideas are not going to be stifled because you're in Anuk or uh, one of the forgotten parties like AFC or whatever. But, but people that, will, that will listen to that is one very important point. And, and I recall pre-2015, uh, you know, to our viewers out there, people like myself, I mean, Brother James, you know this, we are very, very vocal. Uh, you check our social media posts pre-2015, we are very, very vocal against corruption and against what was perceived to be the status of governance then. Um, but, it, it, you know, I think what has happened is that uh, you, you know, a, a lot of Guyanese believe that, that 2015 brought uh, an exchange, not a change. And uh, I mean, uh, to, to my brother James, I mean, the, the truth is there are people like you within the party, as you mentioned, uh, some other youngsters within the party. Yet, uh, for the young people, and, and here's where I'm going to ask Kian to, to comment just before I go to you, brother James. Um, yet, we have seen... Uh, a uh, plethora of, 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 of older persons taking up ministerial portfolios and taking up other important government jobs. Now, we don't have anything against these people because your point was that there may not be enough qualified people locally, which I, I abhor. I, I disagree with that statement. There are qualified people here. Um, they're just not given a chance because they're, uh, you know, some people believe they're one race or the other, or one party or the other. But before we, we, we move ahead, let me ask Ian Jabor to, to comment a bit on, and let's get back to the youth, uh, you know, how do we see youth, uh, how do, do we see youth uh, empowerment in nation building? Has enough opportunities been given? And what can we do to ensure 
that youth of all races be given an equal chance by whoever is in government? So, um, just before I answer that, uh, I like, yeah, honestly, as, as I listen to these two gentlemen, you know, um, clearly you who have a history and who are quite good friends, something I greatly appreciate with them both coming from opposing parties. Um, I can hear in their voices something that Anug um, holds very firm and dear as an ideology within the party, and that is of inclusive governance. Meaning our goal here is not to come in and create another force representing another group of people. But in actual fact, you have two large ethnic parties in this country who throughout history have, um, whether or not they've admitted it or whether or not it's been, um, it's been shown um, uh, through their, their workings, have represented two large races in Guyana. Because of that, we can never do without them. These are critical parts of our political landscape. These two parties represent over 80% of this country, okay? Because that's how our demographic is made up. So what that means is that for Guyana to move forward, it is critical that the APNU-AFC and the PPP work together. All right, we need to break this bond of ethnic voting and we need to start working as one unit. It's all over all the media across the world that report on Guyana now daily as we are now the, 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 you know, the new kids on the block when it comes to oil. Right. Every forum says that we are politically divided through our eth ethnic voting uh, lines. And because of that, the country is not, is being stifled. We're not getting a chance to move forward. So what it takes and what ANUC stands firm for is to have APNU, AFC and PPP walk together and rule this country and run this country and, and govern this country as one unit. That's but, critical. But, but Kian, you, you would have to also address in that, you would have to also address in that uh, suppositioning that you know, inclusive government has its limitations. In other words, if there is no competition, there is no need for transparency. There is, you know, because then everybody be of the same umbrella. And so there is a danger if, if that one needs to assess in talking about inclusive governance. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to be very honest with you, I don't think we are um, short on opposition at the moment in Guyana. Correct me if I'm wrong, there should be about six, seven, political parties vying now. So opposition is clearly not the issue. What it takes is the two large ethnic parties in this country mm -hmm. to work together to represent all Guyanese. It is our job as independents outside the third parties now to be that opposition, to hold them accountable. That's our job. It's their job, these two parties, to govern Guyana. Okay, because they represent most of this country. It's our job as the smaller third parties to hold them accountable. That's our job. We hold a, we hold a, a, a balance of power in parliament. Our job is not to tell these two groups what to do. Our job is to make sure that whatever they promise to do is that we will be the ones to sit there and say, well, you haven't followed through and you need to show us the numbers, be transparent and be accountable. That's a third party's role. These two Correct. major parties is to govern. So I don't dis I don't disagree with you, Kiam, but I think on another reality, and, and I'm going to ask our other two uh, panelists to comment too. The reality of the situation has been in Guyana's winner-take-all politics. The third party, the fourth party, the fifth party could say whatever they want. A president will say, "I don't have to listen to you." And he moves merrily along. We have seen that uh, by all parties. But that's a constitutional uh, reform we need, right? I yeah. Mean, so, so constitutional reform is needed. I don't disagree. But, but the danger there too, and this is where I'm going to open, go back over to Brother James. The, the danger there too is that would, would the PNC and the PPP agree to a constitutional reform? Because without their support, you are not going to get it. Well, there we go. And that's 
Sorry, um, I, I just jump in here. And that's, that's right, exactly yes. what our position is as a third party, as a, as, a, as a party holding the balance of power. It's just to stifle these governments. But it's right. actually to push an agenda of unity, of inclusivity. We have critical, critical aspects within our constitution that need reforming. There, there, there's no judgment about that. There's no, there's no criticizing that. And I know both these gentlemen will agree that there are aspects that need reforming. So it's up to them as the major representatives of this country, as a group governing this country, to come together and say, we need to look as a Guyana as a whole, not just represent our group of people, but I would like to help your group of people. What that means, and let me tell you how this helps everyone. Our problem right now with this winner take all politics is that the loser is completely excluded. There is no chance, there is no voice, there is no option. You just have to sit down, wait your term, and then and then and then you get your chance if 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 the the um, your group decides to speak out or the other one has failed and we have been going back and forth on this for so many years that it's time now for the winner take all politics to stop and a unified government to move forward. Correct. And and I must say, I mean, on our Monday show as is tonight, a lot of people are are, are clamoring that that and I see one of our uh, uh, viewers just commented to also that constitutional reform may not necessarily be the solution as would education of, of what the constitution has and, and what, what we can do or cannot do. Brother James, I want to come to you a little bit. Pardon me if I'm being, uh, uh, if I'm misquoting um, some history. Uh, but I, I have called on you and Robin to be on the show because I know you both, and Kian, sorry, I know that you two of the older generation, um, and I don't mean to call you old, but you are older generation like I am. You two of the older generation, you have been, uh, while putting on a party cap, but you have, re you have maintained your independence to a large degree. And I dare say, Brother James, I don't know if something I should mention in public, but I do believe that your roots also were within the PPP at some stage, if I'm not wrong. Um, my question to you, can the three of you take off your party cap? Put the PNC cap, put the PPP cap, the ANU cap aside. Question. How do you see youth of all races building a united Guyana? What ingredients are necessary? Take the party cap off. Let's just say we have an independent stuff now and there is no party politics. All right. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I could always, whether or not, I, I must say this here. Um, for those who know me, is whenever I speak, I never speak as a PNC man. I never, ever, 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 ever. Uh, it's not me. Um, I speak as a Guyanese. And um, at the end of the day, if we move past labels um, and you see yourself not, a, not a, a, someone could be labeled or subscribe to a particular group, uh, if you see yourself as that, that's how you project your thoughts and views. Right. Um, I, must, I must, before answering your question as, as the youth, I, I, I must clarify a bit what Kian is saying. Kian is not saying, oh, PPP, Civic, and PNC need to come together and form one party and obliterate the other party. I think he's mentioning the areas of, of, of collaboration. We need more areas of collaboration. For example, I say this here. This oil sector, we need everybody. PPP, PNC, AFC, in Anug. Every single Guyanese we need uh, every, as a stakeholder in this industry because it could transform us. I don't believe this oil sector should be managed by one party or one government. So I think he's looking at areas of collaboration uh, where both parties could agree and move the country forward because that's what we all wanted, want to see at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but as for youth, for me, that I, I, in a few years, what I do, I do, I do right. I do craft policies and that kind of thing. That's what I do um, a lot within my own party. And one of the things we have is Vision 2020. Now, we, we came up with that... Um, I pitched the idea to some youngsters uh, in our party. Vision 2020. What is Vision 2020? It is quota-based representation for young people. Meaning, just how you have a third of women have to be on your represent list, your, 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 your list of representatives, and just a third of women has to be in National Assembly, a third of your list must be young people. A third of your National Assembly must be young people. A third of your cabinet must be young people. 
That is where I want to see this country go in terms of youth. A third, quota-based representation, because young people represent in excess of 50% of our population, and it's only right that 33.3% of our best and brightest young people represent us in every single strata of this country, whether it's in politics, whether it's in law, whether it's in the economy, whether it's wherever it is. In all the stratospheres of our society, we must entrench young people, train them, empower them, give them the resources. I felt so good when I see Guyana won the Albert Einstein Award in the robotics uh, uh, competition they had. You know, and that's a program that started in 2015, and we've been able to move in leaps and bounds because of the investment of the First Lady and the and, and government and other stakeholders in pushing this agenda. Guyana is a wonderful place with the best people in the world. The only thing keeping us, keeping us back is us. We Correct. The only people keeping us back. Correct. We're getting where we need to be. So, so, so in terms of, of creating a, a united Guyana, where, where uh, ultimately your children and mine would not, would not suffer the same, the same kind of things we have gone through, um, uh, creating a united Guyana where all races could feel that they belong to the table. And when you're at the table, it not, it's not at the expense of another. Um, in terms of that, what would be the inputs? Robin, I'm coming to you. What would be the yeah. inputs that you would want to see your party make? Um, uh, and, and, and James, you raise a wonderful thing there. Should, should not the parties now consider having, uh, um, you know, part of that list as, as, as a mandatory approach? Um, for, for youth representation and uh, ministerial jobs too. I mean, we have a situation where, where sometimes it seems to be painful to get some people moving. Um, that, that, but, but, yes, go on. That's what I mean, yo. In every single stratosphere, National Assembly, Correct. Cabinet, every single stratosphere, a third young person. Correct. So, so, Robin, over to you. So, so let me give you the answer without the PPP hat and then a bit of what the party is thinking of and that kind of thing. But this is this I've been working with young people for a very long time, maybe 30 years. And what I have found throughout the Caribbean, because that's where I've worked, um, creative thinking was lacking. Our education system, this rote learning system has hurt us badly. We are not a solution oriented. We don't have solution oriented education. We don't have... Um, children coming out of school thinking for themselves enough. And when I say enough, I mean, look, schoolwork is just that. It's schoolwork. It's your basic education. And that's what it is. Um, you're not going to get educated by reading two books for literature in three months. And education has to happen for yourself outside of your school, whatever. When I went to Saints, we had um, woodworking, metal shop. Home economics, 16 subjects in first form, you had to do them. They were not gearing us for CXC, they were gearing us for life. I know to cook, I know to weld, I don't weld anymore, but I do woodwork still as a hobby. Um, and you create a more rounded person. Now, we're talking about youth building a, a better guy, and it starts with creative solutions. It doesn't start with telling a, a young person that you're not as as good as that guy who got the 12 subjects. It starts with saying, you don't need 12 subjects. You weren't, you weren't that kind of guy. You were the guy who can build the spaceship. When we're flying that spaceship one day, they're gonna need a guy in the engine room who can fix pipes. We can't all be the captain. So you start looking for what people are good at and empowering them to achieve along those lines. If you look at a plumber in, in, in the US, they make 150 US an hour. Some way, some might make less, 75 to 150. So let's be very factual. That's what it costs. Plus there's come out costs to your house and whatever. It's just like hiring an attorney. But here, nobody wants to get into plumbing because we don't understand that coming down the line, those service industries are going to dominate in terms of earnings. So we need to start now telling people, start looking at yourself a little more creativity. What are you good at? What are you, the highest paid people in the Caribbean, legally I might add, are, are cricket cricket players. They make millions of US dollars legally. Prime ministers do not. Presidents do not. Cricket players make a lot more than presidents and prime You're ministers. You're not including the presidents of Guyana there, right? Uh, <laughs> let's just not go there. 
as I said, not a party hat. So that's that's my answer as a person who got into politics to help people, is to help them be creative. I want to see a curriculum that has Bob Marley's songs on it because he's one of my heroes. I want to learn about Colin Croft. I want to learn about Clive Lloyd. I don't want to be bogged down with slavery and indentureship the rest of my life because it turned me away from agriculture. I can tell you this personally. I mean, I grew up on a farm and I my father had a, a sugar cane plantation and I didn't want to be there because I always looked at it as as indentureship as 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 this as agriculture later in life I grew to to, to love agriculture and planting and thing because I, I was married to somebody who was good at it um, so, so, so you're looking at you, a reform of the education system a reform uh, to bring yeah. out the best in everyone not just the few who can do the 20 subjects or the 10 subjects I want it to become more, as I say, holistic. It's an overused word, but it's a good word. We need to find every bit of talent and exploit it. All right. So, so at, at one time in our history, there, there used to be uh, a very good um, uh, concentration of funds and efforts in, I think, what was called the community schools, where, where school, uh, the unsuccessful people at, at the CXEs, not everybody can pass, um, yeah. will, will find a path um, to, to acquire skills. Yeah. Um, so, so you are more. Uh, your, your concentration would be towards uh, diversifying the education focus uh, that with certificate based to skill based vocation. Yep, yep. And um, vocational training is a great thing. Um, it, it works, and and even people will move one day. The slow learners, the people who take times to time to process, will one day go back. Some some will go back to school, get their degree, and be your boss one day, and they'll have more skills than anybody who just came out of UG. Right. Um, or any university. The, the party-based answer would be, look, there are a lot of young people in the PPP and in its satellite organization, which is a very loose affiliation of people in the civic. And you see young people there that are bright. And, and it's not 33%. If my calculations are right, it'll be about 70% of people under 50 years old in any or more in any PPP government or next parliament. There's so many young people that um, and, and the older generation in the PPP have been working on passing that bat baton. They've been doing it actively. They've been working and advising what it's like in government to get something done. You know, somebody was talking to me about education reform and, and why don't you just make a plan and deliver it. And I told them you would have to consult with your people working in your ministry, with your teachers or whatever, else you're going to get pushed back. And your plan is not going to get implemented if you don't sit with these people first, the actual people who are going to deliver that change and work with them and, and get buy-in from them as to what those changes are. But, but Robin, you, you, you're, you're starting to sound a little bit like you're on the campaign trail, right? So, so <laughs> for, no, but for those, are, long, those, are, that, that, those are my personal things too. I, I understand. For, for a long time, uh, it's, it's like one of the criticisms they have, they have, they have gotten in the US there presently about uh, you know one of the candidates. Um, plan is good. Nobody none of the governments have actually been cementing those and making them into actions. Kian, I want to come to you with a similar vein. What do you want to see? Take the party cap out um, as, as youth empowerment, youth involvement in nation building. And I want to lead you off with a question that is, well, a statement that is posed by one of our viewers that says, you know, UG, CPC, GSA, etc., churns out Thousands, and this is true, thousands of, of graduates each year. How many of them find a job in Guyana is a question to be, that we need to assess. Well, these are, um, these are your critical points here. Um, when it comes to youth involvement um, and how we can help in nation building, obviously your first leg, like both of these gentlemen have, have expressed, is education. That's, that's, and it's always been a hindrance here in Guyana. It's always been an issue. Um, how uh, how far our our curriculums are developed, and um, what kind of mental support uh, uh, um, mental health issues are supported here in our in our education system? How are we creating well-rounded individuals to go out and be contributing parts of society? So one of the main um, uh, well, I, like, you asked me to take off my my cap here, but I'm going to be very honest, as, a, as an executive member, as the assistant secretary of, of ANU, a lot of our 
party lines and of a lot of our party ideologies and platforms have come from myself and the other youths in the party. So this is something that we actually hold quite close to us. And one of the main aspects that we look at when it comes to youth involvement is that we have um, a, 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 an ideology, a platform in which we like to um, put it into put it into um, put it into words. It's called never no youth should ever come out of the Guyana education system without a marketable qualification. All right? That's the key. At no point in time should any youth ever come out of Guyana's schooling system and not be able to find a job. Well, here's the problem. Um, you get a little bit deeper into our economic issues when you ask, well, what, um, how, how can we get youth more involved? So our issue, largely in part, is our, our educated young are leaving Guyana. There's a huge brain drain because there's no opportunities here. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here right now in a country that thousands, like you just mentioned, thousands of people come out on a yearly basis, educated from our university or our, or our many other institutions. And what are they left with? So they are become educated and they leave. Now right. you're sitting there turning to them and saying, well, we need more youth involved. Well, the youth have gone. So what what did we what what is our next step? Our next step is to attract them back. How do we get youth back into Guyana In get them into our system, have them indoctrinate themselves into Guyanese lifestyle and be a comfortable, be able to raise a family, own a home, make a profit. Don't be, don't run into debt, not be burdened by taxes. These are systems that have to be fixed in order for youth to get more involved because we are already on a back foot when starting our lives. So what I want to hear a little bit more of from our two large governing parties is that they are fixing the economic system in order to give the youth a chance to thrive. And then from there, after we get ourselves on our feet, we can now get ourselves involved in the governing of Guyana. You can't ask a youth right now that's like myself, that's struggling every day. I, I just, I, I have a young daughter. She has school fees, just go every day. I'm, a, I'm in the verge of, of, of buying a home. I have to work, I have to get a business going. How exactly are you proposing I find the time to help with governing a country when I can't even get my life on track? And these are my issues. So. Mm -hmm. As I, I, said, I, I got you. And I think those are some very salient points. I'm going to swing over to Brother James a bit. But just before I come to you, James, um, th there are some very salient points that we're discussing tonight. And, and, and one is, you know, in the empowerment and education of youths, they, there's this constant concern that we do not give youths a chance, they leave, there is a brain drain, and then we come back and say, well, there is brain drain and we can't find people, so we bring in people and give them jobs. I can tell you there are a number of persons, myself included, who thought paradigms would have changed and so thought and sought to make yourself available to, to provide uh, advice, to, to provide, uh, you know, to, to be in the employ of, um, a government, but again, you, you're locked out because to me, what comes first is party loyalty. And Brother James, to you, it, it has to be recognized by your party that the party loyalty will not take Guyana forward. It will take the PNC forward, obviously. And to, to the goodness in your heart, which you've always expressed, ultimately what is important is Guyana's progress. So let me, let me, we, yes, go on. I want to disagree um, respectfully with you, Brother Kian. Um, you mentioned a brain drain, but I want to give you some tangible ex examples. Um, and I, I tend to stay away from the general color blue. Uh, thousands are being, um, how do you say, come, uh, being churned out by your system annually. And where are, these, where are these people? I want to give you some examples, practical examples. Uh, I'm an I'm attorney. Uh, Kamal Ramakran is in my batch mate. About 20 something of us graduated. Uh oh. Yeah, we uh, seem to have. I think James got knocked off. 
Yes. While he is off, Kian, um, I, I looked at the registration database today. I didn't find you in the database. Is there a reason that you're not in the registration database? Were you not informed that you were not? Did you check your name? Maybe he um, didn't collect his ID card. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that could be a large part of the problem. No, no, I am. Um, I am getting myself organized on that part right now. But yes, you are right. I am not so currently. You were, on the list. you were registered in the last thirty-five days. Then. Sorry, I could tell you what my issues are. I actually had my Guyanese passport expire, and they have been giving me a royal run round with renewing it, as they're stating now I need to go back. I was, I was, I've been born in Canada, I lived in Guyana my whole life, my birth parents, etc., yeah. um, uh, etc., Guyanese. But I've had a long history and run around with, with, with uh, passport office. And they're now asking me to get very deep documents that have been taking me a while to get from Canada. So, in that yes, case, I am uh, you, you, will, you wouldn't be empowered to vote in the next election. Maybe not. Um, um, I, what I, I, I want to know is that has a why did you not reach out to somebody like me um, who's always saying to people, I don't care which party you're voting for. I, don't, I want you on the list. I want you to have your rights. You know, I, I, I reach out. You got to understand, I mean, you're new in politics and I'm going to tell you this. A lot of us talk to each other, no matter what you think. All right. People at PNC, the AFC, whatever. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of help offered behind the scenes. And, and when I offer help to people in Anuk, it's the same reason. It's because you're taking a stand, you're bringing a point of view, and it has to be encouraged because we want a better country. Um, let's, let's, I, let's, really let's, liked, I only checked this today. Yeah, let's because, let's gravitate let's gravitate back to our to our to our topic yeah. at hand, and, and I'm sure that we can sort those issues out. Um, yeah. Now, the the, the concern, uh, Robin, as as expressed by Kian Jabor, is that. The, the larger parties may not have have uh, been expressive in their actions um, with with regards to youth empowerment. Do you see a change coming in in the next decade of the PPP? Um, I know that the level of work where we are as an economy today is not where we were 20 years ago. We've been growing, and um, along the way, everybody's been learning hard lessons. The PPP has always been pro youth. In, to, to some, you know, Bar Jagger became president at 35. Um, Irfan is only 38. It's a very large youth base, and those issues are of people going away, migrating, and not finding opportunities are on top of everyone's list because it affects them directly. It's not an abstract. For a lot of the people the, who are with the party and working right now, I can tell you some are about to graduate, some have just graduated. Jobs are important to them. It's not guaranteed that by working with the, the PPP that if they get into power, you're guaranteed a job. But um, it certainly helps. Then there's no, the more people you know it's networking, it helps you. But what everybody knows is that if I am helping people that I know, and my network is large, then I'm helping. This is how you help people. And and those being recent students, you will you will start. I mean, I don't see the mass migration happening that used to happen mm -hmm. uh, because I, I help a lot of people when they get started in university and I stay in touch um, because I've had to guarantee loans. I wrote about it very early in my writings about the need for to tell people, look, if you want people to guarantee, let them self-guarantee the loan. Right. But let's invest. But but let um, me ask. Let's let take me ask the loss if we have to. Let me ask you this, yeah. Robin. Um, you you said that uh, you know, and, and that's an excellent point you made in terms of the age of of both Jack Day and Air Fan. Um, but do you see that if the PPP were to win the next election, that their their ministerial portfolio will be some of those same people who might have made some horrible blunders in the past? I can speak for the because PPP directly. Party, I can speak to a lot of something. the talent that I see uh -huh. that I would hope would be in a government. And there's a lot of young people. I, I put it this way, I would be one of the older people around the PPP right now. Sometimes I feel like a dinosaur. When I, I, I get into meetings, I'm only 52, but I'm the oldest man by far and also sometimes the youngest in politics. Some of these kids have been in the PYO and they're 35. And um, I'm relatively old to them in terms of years, but relatively young in politics. Um, but it's a lot of young people. It's a, it, it, and even in the civic component, you will see a lot of young people. Um, 
basically, I mean, I can tell you in the Civic, one agile and I feel like old men at times. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's so many young people. And they're Just vying. The, the thing is, they're all vying for that ascendancy. So there's healthy competition um, uh, with a lot of young people. Right. So it'll be That's a very true. young government. And I think... Um, your partner is a young man still, and he, still, he has an offer not to offer that. Let me just let me just give this update. I we have lost um, connection with brother James. Um, I rather suspect it seems like his uh, device he was using may have, may have powered off or GPL. GPL. Yes. <laughs> so so um, we are trying. Uh, Devin, our technical guy, is trying fervently to to bring him back on, but uh, we'll continue the conversation. I mean, Kian, let's get back to you. Um, from from your perspective, we mentioned that the parties need to get together to work together to bring youth focus back on track and stuff like that. But from your perspective, what would be uh, a key uh, or two important steps that the PPP um, has to make to to earn your respect, to earn a, a, you know a tap on the shoulder from you as an executive member of ANO. All right. Um, let me first touch. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Robin uh, for his offer just now with his help, and you know it, it does take a little bit of help when, as as you just mentioned, with networking and and and. You know, no man is an island. We have to reach out to each other. But my little problem here is that this is exactly the issue that us youths are stuck in. If we don't, for some of us that don't have friends in higher places, the system is keeping us down and keeping us back. It's not fluent, whether it be the tax system, whether it be security in the country, whether it be as simple as me getting my passport. I mean, it I, and somebody that has... Ha, has a passport that just expired. I mean, it's, it's, it's irrational thinking. And because of these systems that are, that are hindering our everyday lives in this country, it is, it's systematically keeping the youth from getting involved because it's so challenging in our day-to-day -day activities. And unless you have a friend in high places, you're not getting anywhere quickly. So getting back to, um, to, to your question on, um, on Anug and and what I and what I feel. Sorry, just repeat the question for me. I, I just got a little sidetracked there. My question is, what <laughs> one or two things do you think ah, from the PPP? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. You know, you had a senior what? moment there, Kia. I did. I did. I did. I was because I was thinking about the system, all the issues I have to get my name on the list, but and all the issues we have with GCOM. But anyways, um, off topic. But PPP. I, I respect PPP as a youthful organization. I do. And I see a lot of that in Anu. And they get a lot of uh, respect from me because, well, honestly speaking, and not to attack any party, I, we were sorely disappointed in what the APNU had, um, had done uh, and what they had put in, in place when they got into government. Um, what I need to see as an ANU executive and what I hope to see for Guyana from PPP is a willingness to work with APNU. I need to see PPP shaking hands, reaching across the table, as, as, as Mr. Bond said, to the APNU members and saying, listen, we need to stop this racial separation, this ethnic voting, this ethnic division. We need to stop this in this country now. We are, we are in the middle of, of, of this country becoming the richest per capita country on this hemisphere, in this hemisphere. And the only way we can reach the full potential of, of the opportunity that we are given is for PPP to look at APNU and say, listen, we represent um, four to five, you represent four to five, except, you know, um, whatever the numbers may be. And we, we, we represent majority of this country. And unless I, as a PPP member, start representing your constituents and your voters who are loyal to you, then we're not going anywhere. What I want them to do is I want them to bring them in. When I set a system of, of inclusive governance, we have all heard in the past, and, and, and the younger generation may not have, but again, through my own reading, 
shared governance has been promised by both these parties at one time or the other throughout history. And because of that, I would like to see them coming good on this promise. Pro promise. Shared governance is the way forward in this country. And why that's so is because in order for us to represent all Guyanese as a government, as a, for any government, then they have to work with demolishing our ethnic lines. That's our critical aspect. And the only way to do that is to have the two major players stop for a second, stop the division, stop, you know, address the current situation at hand, which, which you know, I'd like to say has, has, has brought out, a, 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 you know, this UG video with this youngster and his racial comments has brought out a, a, a huge discussion across social media platforms and on the news and right. just in general across the country with our racial state, with, with, with the division of this country and what is being fed to the youth that has been that has been come forward from the past that has been that is being served by our elders that that is the issue that needs to stop how do we now get ppp to look at apnu and say stop with this now let's start working in this country based on merit let's let's show a proper track record let's run this country in which all will be represented and move forward we there's systems of governance out there for example the swiss model that both these major parties can govern guyana in an equal capacity and represent both of their constituents. Well said. L let's let's address. Uh, you mentioned something just now that well, um, Robin had mentioned offering to help you with regards to the the registration thing. Robin um, and Kian, what would be your uh, yourself, your personal and your party's uh, you know um, um, views with regards to this current ID card fiasco and 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 you know what's being said by the chairman of GCOM? Well, I've made it clear. I think I've written on it um, very clearly that uh, it will it, it it cannot stand, and I'm very sure when I say it cannot stand that it will not stand, um, because I'm privy to discussions. I know and I'm able to influence things. And I'll tell Kian how I became influential. I wrote. I let my views be known. The PPP read it. The PNC read it, and people, when I call them, they say, oh, the Robin Singh, who writes in the papers? Not the Robin Singh in the PPP, because I'm not a member of the PPP as yet. I may well join before the part, the, the, the elections. But um, the, the thing is, you gotta you got to open your mouth, and I'm glad to see James is back. There you go. James, I miss you, buddy. Hey, James. Um, <laughs> Kian has been, been talking shared governance again. I'm sure you filled yourself in. Yeah, so what I'm saying is... Um, the ID card fiasco uh, is not going to stand, and I, I wouldn't worry about it anymore without saying much more. Uh, we've all ventilated. Those views have been taken on board by members of the commission on both sides, and I think uh, there's been amicable settlement. I can leave it at that, and by tomorrow you'll get your news from somewhere. <laughs> right. Kian, any comments of your party's um, um, concern with regards to the current um, ID card matters? Um we did have a meeting very recently with uh, with Gcom, um, and Anuga got a, got a chance to hear firsthand what exactly is the issues with these um, ID cards and where they're coming from. Um, unfortunately, the it was quite vague information, and and um, what the highly respected uh, Scottit Singh had had mentioned is that um, I think what's being pushed a lot right now in the media. It's not necessarily the facts of the situation. And I think there is a little bit more discourse that's going to be had within GCOM before a, a final conclusion is made. So because of that, uh, Anouk has, has chosen not to comment too much on the situation until all the facts are made very clear and decisions are made within GCOM. Got you. Uh, James, welcome back. Uh, Kian, okay. let, me, let, me, uh, let me ask you another question um, uh, from a youth perspective. Um, it, uh, and, and the other two brothers, we're going to ask for their comment on the same question. Um, a viewer has, has inboxed me to say, to ask uh, whether we think it might now be time for us to institute an aptitude test for those who are going to take on ministerial portfolios and such serious offices in this country. 
An aptitude test um, is... Well, uh, aptitude, I, I guess it means more more than just aptitude, you know? <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, what I think the, the, the question may be stemming from is whether or not I believe that more qualified people for the ministries that they are running need to be, um, need to be involved. Um, well, qualified is, is relative because, you know... But, but um, Kian, it, sorry to cut. In making that statement, do not forget that while... Uh, it is widely believed that Guyana has totally booted logic out of the, the window with regards to the permanent secretaries. Don't forget that the qualified persons, uh, James, correct me if I'm wrong, the qualified persons within the ministries are supposed to be most qualified yeah, or are most suitably qualified, supposed to be the permanent secretaries who are supposed to be the officers uh, that are held accountable, uh, whereas the minister is, is more or less a political appointment. I believe that's that that's the correct situation, and I th I think that's why the system was designed for that uh, that to be implemented. So um, basically, your minister is is o oversees the work when when you have a permanent secretary that's the actually qualified position. Mm -hmm. And as a businessman, I actually um, I'm not completely opposed to um, to to that uh, that type of system. The reason being is, uh, for example, I'm about to open a new restaurant, but I'm not a chef. That doesn't mean I can't manage my restaurant or know what should be happening. Right. What I do, though, is I understand that my chef is a qualified individual to run my kitchen. And because of that, he needs to be given mm -hmm. that opportunity un, 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 unhinged or, 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 or unaffected by my personal decisions or my political affiliations. And I think that's where the issues are coming in. So... How we need to, we, what, what needs to happen is this system needs to be revamped a little bit, all right? And again, maybe a little bit more constitutional reform here, in which we need to have less political um, hindrance or less political involvement in the day-to-day -day runnings of these ministries. We have an issue right now of, of, of micromanagement, and that's what's causing a lot of ineffectiveness within these ministries. So that's my point of view when it comes to hoping that I, I, you know, our next government, um, whether it be us or any of these two large parties, that we can implement some systems to give the qualified personnel the opportunity to get this country in these individual sectors back on track, whether it be health or security or, or, or education, public infrastructure. We need qualified individuals to be handling and manning those positions on a day to day basis. Thank you. Let, let me ask you, gentlemen, a question, all three of you. Uh, will you and your party support a constitutional change to remove and re or reduce the immunity of the president? Um, by the one who would have been missing the action, if I may jump in, um, just, 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 uh, just make quickly the point I was going making before I was cut off, um, fault of mine, of course, is I was telling Kian that uh, he's, he's saying that there's a, uh, a deaf. No. James. James, take again. <laughs> okay, Robin, let take me, question. Let, we'll... let, let me take up the cousin. One is, um, Kian, is that there's been a lot of, you know, your platform is constitutional reform, fine, but there's been a lot of constitutional reform. What also there's been is a lot of codifying of the minister's work. So where it used to be discretionary to do things, there, a lot has been codified. So uh, let's say remigrants used to have to go in and meet the minister in the late 80s and early 90s. And you'd have to make a case to the minister and then he would grant you some concessions. Uh, that was codified so that once you were away five years, blah, 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 you amount, these amount of concessions you get, and that's it. And that's been happening a lot. It's a process. And a lot of those responsibilities were taken out of the, the hands of the PPP ministers. Some, somehow they've been put back in. Uh, I guess if you don't write a law, it can be changed by policy and management style. Fair enough. Um, when you go to an aptitude test, um, it's it's a it's a great idea, and I'm all for that kind of thing. But um, you also got to look at what people give up to go into office. Um, I remember having a conversation with Barrett Jagdio. You know, remember he was finance and economist, and he's a very bright gentleman. And I think by becoming president, 
he actually gave up an awful lot. And the world might have lost something because he was coming up with new theories, new economic theories that, that would have affected not only Guyana, but other countries in the world would have learned from those theories had he been allowed to develop them. And, and we pigeonhole people when we make them a minister. And when we make them a, a president, we make them a jack of all trades, especially if we operate without a portfolio as the current president is. So you'll just know a little bit about everything. And somewhere 10 years down the line, you're no longer the specialist you were. Um, and I'm all for an aptitude test. You must have some management skill. You must be able to deliver. But that's where the president comes in. If you're not delivering, he needs to change you. If you but, have a manifesto but, in but front see, of you with a plan. See Robin, you see, Robin, yeah. that's one of the dangers with inclusive politics. Because now, I mean, I'm sorry James is not on, but yeah. the question that would beg to be asked is, is in the coalition, for example, they are stuck with a formula. And so if, if a particular party, they, they're stuck with a formula. And, and so aptitude doesn't really, is not as important. And aptitude is lacking. Yeah, it's honest, it, it, without being part, partisan, and I, I hate doing this without James present because yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really I, sorry, I'm, I'm strong, but um, yes, there's been some 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 square pegs in wrong holes, and they haven't been able to perform. So, and, so we're we're quickly running out of time. Um, I'm really sorry, uh, we all are that James isn't here, but uh, because I wanted to discuss the, the ministerial performances and so forth, let's talk about this presidential immunity. Will you and your party support? a uh, reduction uh, or, or uh, you know, getting rid of, of um, the president's ability to answer for his actions and for his decisions. I might have to look at that, but I, I think it's, if I looked at, for example, what has happened in the US, and this, these are my thoughts, is watching the, the whole Trump phone call to Ukraine, it might serve a political purpose to embarrass Donald Trump and, and, and probably impeach him, but what does it do for the next 50 U.S. presidents when they're on a phone call to leaders around the world and trying to get something done? Am I, as, say, leader of Guyana, going to be comfortable speaking to a U.S. president, knowing that my phone call can one day be in the open? And, and that's the kind of thing we got to be careful about with immunities of presidents, is ham hamstringing them in the ability to get things done. Yeah, um, but, but a president don't, has don't, to make decisions. Don't forget don't forget that, that the, the, the discussion or, or the disagreement is when Trump has used uh, state funds for personal gain or, or, or for his own personal, yeah. you and know. The thing is, I, I, I don't want to hamstring any president of Guyana. I think they have an expectation for um, decisions that do not let you can't legally decide to, you know, you have immunity from murder. So should you decide to bump off somebody, you have no immunity from that. So there must be maybe a clearer definition of the immunities um, to separate business decisions from ones that you gain maybe personally from. Yeah, because remember President Grinter, uh, you know, gave a pardon to, to the Minister of Finance not, not too yeah. long. Um, and I think um, that's wrong. He should, they should have paid paid out the settlement and not use the courts. Because the, 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 the thing is, you've undermined now the confidence of businessmen to say, we can get justice in a Guyana court against the government of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so everything is going to have to be codified and say, well, the immunity applies to these kinds of decisions, but not to the other kind. Mm -hmm. So if you're personally benefiting, I don't think you should, let's say, from a corrupt transaction, there should be no immunity. Correct. Well, well, yeah, and, and therein lies the, the discussion or the meat of it, because should not the president's action be uh, allowed to be assessed and analyzed by the courts, which is an independent, like what's happening in the U.S.? Forget whether Trump is, is engaged in something or not. That, that's, that's what will be determined. But what it does is allow a process of such determination. Ken, what are your thoughts on presidential immunity and your party? Well, you see, this is a, an, an absolutely clear-cut situation, in, in, in my opinion. I mean, the answer is yes. The presidential immunity has to be reassessed and readdressed, and, and, and it, it cannot exist anymore. Why? Because, and I'm going to touch on, on, an, on the example that uh, Robin gave, what's going to happen if he's on the phone with a, a president from another country and, and that, and that uh, hinders, you know, 
any kind of progress in their discussion or can be or can be um, monitored and, and brought back out. The fact of the matter is the president is not answerable to other presidents. He's answerable to the people of the country. This is his constituency. These are the people that put him in office. And everything that he does must must be assessed and must so, be looked at with a, with I under the microscope. You can run a country. No, I, I, I'm not, I'm not finished you yet. Run a country in, in I, that, I, I, that I, much I, with that much transparency. Let let, let, Kian, let Kian wrap up his point and then. We'll... Yeah. So the fact of the matter is, at no point in time can anyone ever ever justify a president having secret transactions or not needing to come full transparency, full um 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 um. Full, uh, full openness with the yes. decisions they're making. Accountability for his actions. The, the reality is, and, and I agree with, with what he said, um, with the fact that with, with the pardoning recently, and that's, that's utter, that's ridiculous. There's no point in time could these things be tolerated in a country, especially in this day and age, especially in the era that Guyana is now in with this oil, that he can make decisions and not be, um, uh, not have repercussions of, of poor decisions. It's right. a reality. It's, it's nonsense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to our viewers out there, um, uh, once again, we lost Brother James. And, and uh, you know, if I may say so, this time his, his, his uh, again, the second phone he tried to connect through, uh, the battery died. And, and so uh, we are out of program time. <laughs> so um, as I normally do, I'll invite uh, the two remaining, uh, you know, the two remaining boxers <laughs> in the ring tonight. Um, Kian, final thoughts, 30 seconds. Youth um, you know, empowerment, youth perspective and current politics. You know what, as a youth here, I, I honestly would just like to see that these governments come together and work in the best national interest of all Guyanese. I'm here not representing one individual or one race or one group of people. I'm here, I've gotten involved in this because I want to see one forward-thinking government, one, one, one transparent, accountable government that can hold one head with all the rest of the constituencies across the country, all the rest of the groups of people, all the other races across the country and represent everyone equally. And that's why we're here. We're here to get rid of race-based politics. As a youth, I was not born a racist. I have no racism in me and nor do I think any of us as youth sure. now exposed need or want anymore. Sure. It's over, new governance, new politics. Robin, final thoughts, 30 seconds. I would seconds. say to the youth, because it's a youth empowerment thing, I'll stick to the youth, is um, start with yourself. Uh, at age seven, read extra, do extra. Help your father with woodworking, with the car, whatever. Find your talents. Discover your own talents. Help your children to discover the talents. Um, help every... Th this is where it's going to start. Not with the political parties, but at home. With your grandparents telling you, well, let, let's try to make a walking stick or a piece of furniture, or fix the car, whatever it is, get yourself curious in reading, writing, fixing, being involved in, 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 in activities that could help you discover your talent. In the meanwhile, I will work hard with the PPP to get that enabling environment. So when you bring your talent, it can go as far as possible with it. Wonderful. Well, gentlemen, thank you all so very much. Um, Kian, it's been good to have you on board. and. Um, Robin, of course, it's good to always have you in any discussion, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to another such discussion in the near future. I'm sorry that we had to um, lose the connection with Brother James, but again, I'm sure he's always willing. He's, he's personally assured me he's always willing to come on these discussions. So I'm looking forward to having a discussion with you gentlemen again in the future, and I will tell viewers out there um, we are hoping next week to have a discussion with some of the, the election GCOM commissioners. Um, we are presently trying to, to get them um, locked down, um, you know, and this will be post uh, release by the Madam Chairman. I think that is due tomorrow or the next day. On that note, I must also say we ran a little poll that says what party would mo be more inclusive of youth strategies? Uh, the PPP was uh, uh, viewers selected PPP 77%, APNU, AFC 10%, and neither of the two 13%. So great job to our panelists, and I certainly look forward to another discussion. And let's work together to ensure that we can change the political paradigm for the inclusion and involvement of everyone in Guyana and not at the expense of anyone. Gentlemen, 
Thank you to our viewers. Thank you. It's been a wonderful night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you.